This is Lesson 9 of 1 Corinthians, uh, Sunday School Lesson for October 24, 2021. Father, thank you for uh, once again allowing us to come together to study and to worship, and we ask that you be with us as we study this lesson. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we are working on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, down to verse 18. Now, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you eat to meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. Now, he's going to be talking about the next few verses about communion, the uh, observe, observing of communion. And uh, he says it is not done well in this church. Um, there are splits. There are things that are not not understood. And he says the the splits are, in, uh, are manifested particularly in that one comes to eat, is hungry, and another comes to drink the wine and is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now this is a common passage when people in various churches celebrate communion, they use this passage for a guide in how to do things rather than going to each of the Gospels and uh, reading what Jesus uh, had done in each, each time. So, we are going to be talking about the practice of communion for a little bit. Here, let me note this thing. When Jesus, this, this is clearly the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples and his, uh, in the night in which he was betrayed, this is the last supper with the disciples, the apostles. He was. He took bread, and I want to I want you to notice, artos. Now, artos is the Greek for ordinary bread. It's not unleavened bread, but it is normal leavened bread that's eaten with every meal, uh, in and out, in, in each day. Is not matzos. Matzos would be un leavened bread and there's been controversy about what kind of bread do you use to celebrate the uh, communion and some people take the, the position that Jesus being sinless was pure he was out sin at all and the sin would be represented by the leaven in the bread. And so he would represent unleavened bread. And so one should use 
unleavened bread in the celebration of communion. However, what this says in the Greek is that this is ordinary bread, not unleavened bread. And so others take the position, well, Jesus did it the way it should be done. And so the bread that he used at the Last Supper was ordinary daily bread. And we should use that in remembrance of what he did at the Last Supper. And when he had given thanks, Eucharisto, uh, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, obviously, when he broke the bread, he said, This is my body. But what he actually meant, this represents my body. Because he, in his body, and fully alive, was standing before them. And the bread was broken. Now, in the Textus Receptus, which was uh, the Greek text, uh, published by the Beza, B-E-Z-A, brothers, and a number of other people, so that the um, the text that they came up with um, has many common traits. But the Textus Receptus, which is the is the Greek text from which the King James version was was translated. Um, and therefore, the King James says, broken for you. Now, in the original description of Passover, it was pointed out that the Passover lamb had no bones broken. And, in fact, when Jesus was on the cross and he was... Uh, uh, representing uh, the true Passover lamb, when the three people on the on the crosses uh, were hanging there, the people uh, asked that they be taken down because the Passover was at hand. And so the soldiers did a common practice. They went to each of the three on the crosses and they began to break their legs. Now, when they break the legs of someone uh, in, who, who's being crucified, they can no longer push up in order to breathe and therefore they are going to die pretty soon. It hastens their death. And so they broke the legs of two of the people on the crosses, but when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead, and so they did not break his legs in accord with the original description of the Passover. Now, therefore, it's questionable whether he prophesied that his body would be broken for you because uh, there's not any good evidence that he, his body was broken. Certainly, he had a spear thrust into his side. But so far as we know, there, there were no ribs broken or anything of that sort. He... Uh, had the, the skin torn off his back that because he moved up and down on the rugged, that is, unplaned surface of the cross. But that is not exactly the breaking of his body. And uh, most uh, modern commentators and translators say that the, uh, the, the King James or, and the trans, 
in the Textus Receptus, insertion of broken is in error. And uh, what he says, this is my body, which is for you. And of course, it was representative of his body. Do this in remembrance of me. That is, eat the bread in remembrance of my death on the cross. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, we don't know exactly what was in the cup. We presume probably wine. We don't know that. The modern observation, particularly in the Baptist church, is to uh, use grape juice uh, instead of wine. And uh, uh, when we went to uh, Israel, we had a communion service at, at the Garden Gate. And the material that we drank in the cups didn't look like grape juice. It was not purple or blue. It was pretty much colorless. And I thought it might be uh, apple juice, but nevertheless, there was something in the cup. And he said, drink from this cup because the cup represents the new covenant in my blood. I don't want to go deeply into the new covenant because we don't have time, but uh, there are two uh, Old Testament passages which are interpreted and uh, actually say they represent the new covenant. And one of those is in Jeremiah chapter 30, and the other is in Ezekiel chapter 36. And uh, it represents the what the new covenant is and how it is different from the old covenant. Primarily, there's an emphasis upon the insertion or incoming of the Holy Spirit in the human spirit of the believer. That when someone comes to Christ in faith and in trust, the Holy Spirit enters into them and after that indwells in the human spirit of that person. And there's an emphasis on the emphasis on the insertion of the new of the uh, Holy Spirit in the new uh, in in the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit represents the insertion of spiritual life into a person who was previously dead spiritually. And in so doing, he assured them of everlasting life and the ability to live in the presence of the Godhead rather than being consigned to hell. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is, you shout it forth, you proclaim it. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, that is, in a communion service, in an unworthy manner, now notice what he says, unworthy manner, because this is not an adjective. It does not represent a person being worthy or unworthy, because nobody is worthy but the manner in which it is done, which in which you approach the elements in, 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 in communion 
is important. This is an adverb, not an adjective. Shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the blood, bread and drink of the cup. And he does that properly if he understands the manner in which these elements should be handled. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment, crema, to himself. If he doesn't judge, diacrino, the body rightly, so he is fully aware of his personal uh, unsuitability to take the communion, but he is also aware of the importance and the uh, uh, sanctity of how he deals with the cup and the bread. And Paul then goes on to say a scary thing. He says, for this reason, you're un unworthily taking communion. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. That is, a number of you have died because of that. And that makes you think and have pause about how you handle the elements in communion. But if we judge ourselves rightly and we understand what we're doing, we would not be judged by anyone else. That is, if we judge ourselves and we act appropriately, no one else would judge us, particularly the Lord. But when we're judged, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we'll not be condemned along with the world. This is, I believe, similar to Paul talking about consigning someone or turning someone over to Satan so that they can be punished, but so that we, they will not lose their salvation. And I think it's a very similar thing here. That if we mishandle the elements then in communion, then if the Lord judges us, he will do so in a way that we will not be condemned to hell along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. And don't depend upon getting the bread at communion for your food so that you will come together for judgment. So you eat and drink at home and don't drink the cup because you are thirsty. The remaining matters in their letter I will arrange when I come. That brings us to chapter 12. And things are not going to get any easier. Um, he says, now concerning spiritual pneumaticos, uh, you can recognize the pneuma in that, uh, gifts from the Spirit. Gifts does not exist in the Greek, and it's italicized in the King James, for example. I put a line through it but to, just to indicate there is no such word there. So what he actually says is now concerning spiritual brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. And when Paul says that, he means you are unaware. And I am about to clarify it. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols. However, you were led, good or bad. 
and, and you worship the idols and you were led by them and the the idols were made out of wood or stone or something and they didn't walk they didn't talk they didn't think they didn't do anything and they simply represented a false god a god that does not exist and he had made that point earlier that don't be put off by idols they are worthless therefore in case you heard a spirit i've added i make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of god that is the holy spirit says Jesus is accursed. Nobody who truly indwells by the Holy Spirit is going to say Jesus is accursed. Now, at some point, this phrase, Jesus is accursed, is the expected statement that the people were expected to say to indicate that their allegiance was to Caesar and not to Christ, and they would say, Jesus is accursed. Well, that doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. It may come from an evil spirit or another spirit, but not the Holy Spirit. And no one can say and mean it, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is an outcry from a person who is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, charisma, and that means the charisma or the spiritual gifts, but the same spirit, variety of ministries, diakonia, and you see the origin of the word deacon, and the same Lord. Now, let me clarify something at this point. Everyone who has come to Christ in faith and in trust, the, the Father, the God the Father, has assured Jesus the Son that those who come to him in faith and in trust would be adopted by God the Father and would become his son or daughter. So, You understand then that it is by nature that when you become a Christian, born again, born from above, new life, then that is you get a singular gift, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So everyone who is genuinely becomes a Christian is thereafter indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So that you have the singular gift that every Christian gets, but the Holy Spirit will bring with him at least one spiritual gift by which we mean there is a capability a particular bent toward doing something which does not come from anything other than the spirit gift and so he says there are a variety of gifts in addition to the singular gift of the Holy Spirit, but the same Spirit. Variety of ministries, they're the same Lord. Varieties of effects, what happens, dinner gives. 
but the same God who works all things in all purposes, all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit for the common good. And you notice the emphasis, sumpero, for the common good. And that means when you exercise the gift that you have been given, whether it's one or many, it is to be exercised for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, and that is the Christians. And it is for the common good, not for your own personal good, exclusively, although that does occur as well. Talking about spiritual gifts, the additional gifts given by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is given to everyone who becomes a Christian, but the Holy Spirit, in addition to indwelling the human spirit of the believer, will bring with him at least one additional gift, by which we mean it is certain abilities or certain propensities which are given miraculously as a simple gift, and uh, he lists some here. The word of wisdom through the Spirit, and another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Uh, knowledge is one thing, and the ability to use it properly is wisdom. And to another faith, people vary in how much faith they have. Another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Be very careful there. We know that God can heal and does heal, but we be careful about believing that there are people who routinely can heal and have a particular gift. Most of those who claim to have that gift are going to be fake. Another, the affecting of miracles. And watch out because Satan has the ability to produce effects that appear to be miracles. Don't get fooled by that. To another, prophecy. Prophecy means uh, being a prophet. And the hallmark of the prophet is not selling, uh, not telling the future, but thus saith the Lord. And those who have the gift of prophecy have the particular ability to bring the word of the Lord to the people. To another, the distinguishing of spirits that don't get fooled by fate spirits or evil spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. I'm going to stop here because uh, we need to spend some more time on this, and this is where I will start next time, and we'll take up the question about speaking in tongues and, and so on. And meanwhile, we will present some specific prayer requests for the consideration by God the Father in the authority given to us by Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Father, we will present some specific requests and we ask that you hear them and we ask that when we leave this place, you go with us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.